In part five, I want to have a look at conductors in more detail and a model which predicts Ohm's law based on the movement of electrons in that conductor. Now you'll remember that conductors, like sodium in the example we've been using, have a range of very narrowly spaced bands, only some of which are occupied by electrons. So it's very easy for electrons to move from one orbit to another orbit. And they can move in orbits which are associated with different places in the lattice and thereby move throughout the lattice of this conductor. The model that we'll be using, which was first proposed by Paul Adruda, is that these electrons move throughout this lattice a bit like little balls in a pinball machine, bouncing off the fixed nuclei which remain stationary in the lattice. So we could animate this and it would look something like this. With these little red electrons moving around and bouncing off the blue nuclei. If we put an electric field across this conductor, then these electrons would experience a force in one direction. In this particular case, from left to right, and they would all start moving this way. I'll increase the field strength. See, all the electrons begin to move in this direction. Some of them are now moving in curved paths as they experience the acceleration due to the force pushing them that way. Now this animation isn't implementing the model that Paul Druder proposed in two important respects. The first one is that this model is currently treating the atoms a bit like balls of rubber. So if a electron bumps into an atom, it will bounce off in the direction that it arrived at, as if it was hitting a rubber obstacle. Well, the model of Paul Druder said, no, actually electrons don't bounce off atoms like that. It is more accurate to think of an electron being absorbed by an atom and then released by that atom a short time later. And the direction that the electron is released in is completely random. So no matter which direction the electron arrives at the nucleus, the direction the electron leaves is completely random. And that looks more like this. The second difference is that Druder suggested that after being released by an atom, the electron always emerged with the same velocity. It didn't matter how fast the electron had been traveling when it arrived at the atom, it would leave the atom with the same speed. So, what's actually going on is something more like this. And if you make those assumptions, then you can derive a fairly simple expression for the resistance of a block of material. The derivation goes like this. Have to define a couple of terms before we start. Tor is the average time between collisions. That's the mean time between collisions. And N is the density of electrons, the number of electrons per cubic meter. Not total number of electrons, but the number of free electrons, the ones in the conduction band which are able to move around. Maybe I'll call them number of mobile electrons per cubic meter. Oh, and both the simulation and Druder assumed that electrons do not interact with each other. They can, if necessary, pass straight through each other. It's not a terribly accurate assumption, but it will get us to this useful formula. Right, now let's consider a block of this material, which is either a cylindrical shape or at least has a constant cross-sectional area. 
then we can consider a volume of this material here, which has a cross-sectional area of A and a length V, where V is the average velocity at which the electrons are moving, and say that the total charge passing that point in the circuit there in one second will be the total amount of charge that's in this volume of the material. If it's travelling in this direction with speed v, then any charge there after one second will have travelled a distance v and will have arrived here, so everything in this volume must have passed that point there. So, the current flowing would be that's the amount of charge passing that point there in one second, which is the amount of charge in this volume, is just V, the velocity, times the cross-sectional area, that's the volume of this part of the solid, times the number of elect electrons, the number of mobile electrons per cubic metre, times the charge on each electron. And that would be the total amount of charge that passes that point and therefore equal to the current. Now, what's the velocity? Well, consider these electrons. These electrons in a electric field will experience a force on them given by E times Q. The electric field strength times the charge gives you the force. The force is also equal to the mass times the acceleration. In this case, the mass of an electron times the acceleration. Now, Druder assumed that just after a collision, the average velocity of an electron is zero. He actually said that the speed of the electron is constant, uniform, but it's equally likely to emerge from a atom in any direction. So its average velocity in any direction is zero, equally likely to go anywhere. There's an equation of motion. The velocity, the final velocity, is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. The initial velocity is zero. The acceleration is, from this expression here, the electric field strength times the charge divided by the mass of an electron. And the time. Well, if the time is the mean time between collisions, then if I multiply the acceleration by the mean time between collisions, that will be the mean velocity just before a collision. I'll call it VBC, the average velocity just before a collision. The mean velocity, however, will be exactly half that, because the velocity starts at zero and ends up at VBC just before a collision. So the velocity is actually increasing from zero up to a value of EQ tor over ME over a period of time tau, after which it goes back to zero and starts up again, and so on. And the average value of the velocity will be this, exactly half the value of the velocity at the collision. So the average value of the velocity that I'm interested in in my current expression is half of VBC. So I could write the current equals E Q tor over 2 Me times A N Q. That's a second Q. I could write that as Q squared here. OK, that's the current. What about the potential difference? Well, the electric field strength is the force on a unit charge. So the electric field strength over a certain distance L will be the force times distance. Force times distance is work or energy. 
So that's the amount of work or energy that it takes to move a unit charge over that distance L from one side of the conductor to the other. However, the energy required to move a unit charge between two points is by definition the potential difference between them. So that's also going to be equal to the voltage across my conductor. So I've now got an expression for the voltage and the current. I can therefore work out an expression for the resistance. It's just the voltage across my conductor divided by the current flowing through my conductor, which is E times L divided by this lot, E Q squared tau A N over 2 M E. The electric field cancels. That ends up with the formula R, the resistance, is L times 2 times the mass of an electron divided by the cross-sectional area A, the mean time between collisions, the number of mobile electrons per cubic metre and the charge on an electron squared. And you'll notice that this is not a function of the electric field strength and it's not a function of the current. So that is confirming Ohm's law. The ratio of the current to the resistance is constant. It's not a function of the voltage difference. It's not a function of how much current is actually flowing. This also predicts that the resistance would be proportional to the length of the conductor. If you double the length of the conductor, you double the resistance, and that the resistance is proportional to 1 over the area of the conductor. Make it bigger in cross-sectional area, and the resistance goes down according to this expression. And both of those can be shown to be experimentally true for large blocks of material as well. So it's quite a successful model, despite being really quite simple. OK, next time we're going to look at semiconductors in a bit more detail and doping.